Happy Sabbath. Happy day. I want to greet all the ladies in red and white. Happy Sabbath. Can you wave back at me, ladies in red and white? And now I want to greet the ladies in blue, yellow, orange, magnola, magneta. Happy Sabbath. You all look lovely. But the ones in red look lovelier. Happy Sabbath, men and children. Yes, I want to welcome you to the AWM Sabbath. It has been a week of God's goodness. We have been blessed. How many have been blessed together with me? For those who attempted to come, even one day, I know that you are a true testimony that we have been blessed. Now, the theme for this week, I mean this year, has been a love that precedes one's choices. A love that precedes one's choices. We have been blessed by the ladies. This year we said we are going to do a DIY. You know what is a DIY? It's a do it yourself. No new speakers, it's us. And I want to confirm that the ladies have done a good job and every day we were blessed. On the first day, we had our shepherdess, Madam Janetta Law, and she helped us to understand what is really the true meaning when the, Lord, when the theme says, a love that precedes one's choices. What does it mean? And she drew her confirmation from the book of 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10, which says that this love, not that we loved God, but he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And he says, dear friends, since God loved us, we also ought to love one another. This to us has been a week of love. No wonder we are wearing red. Our Valentine has come early. And on the second day, we had a wonderful story about Rahab. Rahab is known to many as a harlot or a prostitute. But then, because the love of God precedes our choices, we were taught about how God reached out to Rahab with love. And we are told that Rahab made a love choice for her life. And on the three, we talked about Christ as a model of love. Not only did he love us, but he has expressed to us how to love one another. And on day four, we were told the reason Christ loves us is not that we can feel there is so much love around us. It's so that we can share the love with other people. You are loved to love. And yesterday, our shepherdess, Madame Anisa Kali, taught us the most controversial topic, how to love difficult people. We came here saying, let us be taught how to love difficult people. But we actually learned that we are the difficult people. Today is a blessed day. And this afternoon, we have a transformational love seminar. I want to invite you, all of you. You know, as women, we live fake lives. Tell your neighbor, don't live a fake life. Fake lives. So this afternoon, we are going to learn how to live the true self. And there's be, are going to be a panel of powerful women of God telling us, because Christ loved us, how should we love ourselves? Many women and men have not even forgiven themselves. So you cannot give what you don't have. If you cannot love or forgive yourself, you cannot do that to another person. I want you to come. Don't go home and close yourself in the room and start crying and wondering why you are the one who loves and you are not loved. Come and understand what is spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity means you love irregardless of the circumstances. 
I want you to ask God to speak to you this morning. Say, God, speak to me. My ears are open. I want you to speak to me. Just pray. Don't look at me. Pray. Tell God, I want you to speak to me. Let me hear what you have in store for me. us pray our father in the name of Jesus we want we want to come to your presence Jehovah may you speak to us this week you have taught us about your love and we are here to ask ourselves a question are we assured of your love speak to us O oh Lord in Jesus name we pray amen so the title of my sermon today is a question and the question is are you truly, really assured of the love of God? What God has done this week was to display his love for us. If you did not attend any of the days, I request you to go to the YouTube channels, to the Facebook channels, and listen to those clips. They were powerful. I cannot stand here and repeat them. I just want us to reflect because the love of God has been displayed to us, I want to ask yourself a question. Are you sure that the Lord loves you? We have seen that throughout the week. That the Lord has tried to break limitations to reach out to us in love. And that is why he was able to reach out to people as despised as Rahab. He was able to reach out to people who were hated like Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, if you ask me. I don't know how to say Sachus. Is it Sachus or Sakas? Zacchaeus. People who were despised in the society. But God took the initiative to reach out to them in love. And so, it is not by our choice that God came to us. He chose to love us. And that is what it means that his love preceded our choices. So that by the time we are making our own choices, his love had already come to us. Are you really sure that God loves you? Are you assured of God's love? In other words, are you confident that God's love reigns within you? Can you for sure declare that I am beloved? Beloved is one word, but it's a powerful word. I am the beloved of the Lord. Can you stand and say in front of the congregation that I am the beloved of the Lord? The Bible has given us all manner of assurance. Every chapter of the Bible, the Lord reminds us that I love you. Every time you open the pages of the word of God, the Lord reminds you, you are my beloved. Every time you open the word of God, he reminds you that you are the apple of my own eyes. And any time you open the Bible, he reminds you that I have loved you with an everlasting love. The Bible says in the book of First John, chapter 3 and verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should even be called the sons of who? The sons of God. Behold simply means look and see the manner of love that the Father has given unto us. Even as filthy as we look, he has called us to become his sons. To become who? To become his daughters. 
And the John, in the same book, I mean, in the book of John 3.16, we all know it. It says that for God so loved the world that he gave his son again. There is no 10 chapters of the Bible that you will look and you will not see the assurance of God's love. But are you assured? Do you truly believe that God loves you? And this is a question we are going to be asking ourselves today. Are we confident that God loves us? Now, the reality of life is this. When we are doing well, we say, God loves me. But the reality of life is that when we go through pain, when we go through tribulations, when we go through shame, when we go through defeat, when we go through a turmoil, we begin to doubt the love of God for us. When tribulations come, you begin to whisper yourself and ask yourself, does God really love me? And no wonder, at every stage of the word of God, the Lord is reminding us, you are my beloved. It is because he knows there are moments in your life that you will begin to doubt him. And there are moments in your life that you will look at your situation and begin to magnify the situation and forget the very thing, the assurance of God's love. Praise God. Maybe you are going through sickness. Maybe you are going through shame. Maybe you have raised your children in pie the finder in adventurers and you anticipated that there will be great men. But they are not doing drugs they are going to alcoholism and you begin to ask God do you love me maybe you got yourself married in church and you had a hope that me and my husband and my children we will serve the Lord forever but one day your spouse starts getting hooked in adultery and now your marriage is going into rocks do you still believe that the Lord loves you are you assured of his love? If there is anything the enemy does when we go through struggles, is to put us in a corner and isolate us and begin to whisper to us and you begin to misinterpret the love of God for us. But this day, the Lord is reminding us, behold what manner of love. The Lord has done what? has given unto us. Behold, behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. That we Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. That despite the storm, despite the tribulation, despite the hate and the pain, his love is above. To an extent that he has called you his daughter. To an extent that he has called you who? His son. And sometimes it's very normal for us to be angry when the doctor tells you that this is cancer, or when the doctor tells you that this is HIV, or this is so and so, and you ask God, where have you been? It is very normal. It is very normal to ask yourself that this child I have been praying for all this time has now died. What should I do? Even the disciples, in the book of Mark chapter 4 and verse 38, we are told that Jesus was with them in the boat. And they could see Jesus at the corner. But when the boat began to sink, they asked Jesus a question. And this was the question. Carest thou that we perish? 
Jesus, you are sleeping in the boat and the storm is sinking our ship. Carest thou that we do what? That we perish. Maybe you are there. In other words, forget about Greek or whatever. I don't know which language is that. In our own mother tongue, in our own language, is asking, do you care? Do you really care that we are about to perish? Yeah? And maybe you are asking God the same question. Do you really care? For how long shall I call upon your name? For how long shall I cry alone? You know, women, we like to cry in the bedroom and cry. Then when we come out and your children are greeting you, you're like, hi. Two-faced people, isn't it? Those tears, the Lord is telling us that you shall cry, cry no more. Because his love has come to assure us once again that it doesn't matter what you go through. His love never ever changes. Amen? Now, God's word sometimes can fail to make sense. Yeah? And you look at it and you wonder. When he says that children are a heritage. Yeah? A mind representing that heritage. Sometimes you look at yourself, you are held, and the Bible says that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And you look at your temple with injections, with drugs, day and night. And you ask, what kind of a temple is this? And so, when the disciples saw that the boat was sinking, they looked at Jesus at the corner and he was silent. And this is a moment, sometimes we go through in life, that we call the moment of the silence of God. And it happens. What do you do when the Lord is silent? What do you do when the Lord is silent? In storms, storms will always come. But the most important question to ask yourself is, who is in the storm with you? Ask your neighbor, who is in the storm with you? If you see Jesus, then you know that you will sail through to the other side. You know, a friend of mine was telling me that uh, the reason why Jesus slept in the boat is because as far as he was concerned, the last discussion he had with the disciples was, let us cross over to the other side. Do you remember? Just before they crossed, he told them, let us cross over to the other side. So what is your business? So Jesus did what? He slept. Because as far as he is concerned, he was added to the other side. And so, whenever you are in the storm, look at the bigger picture. Where are you going? Is it the boat that is sinking? It doesn't matter. What matters is that you are added to the other side. But if you see Jonah in your boat... If you see who, then you know that you have to sing a pinky, pinky, ponky. Father, I had a what? I think I need to look for that lawyer to give me the words. If you are in the storm with Jonah, and Jonah is sitting at the corner, and all he's doing is waiting for you to ask yourself questions, and you're asking yourself, where is God? Where is our boat sinking? And the guy, he's just at the corner there, huh? watching you. And then he says, after all the picky pinky ponky, he says, I am the man. I don't know, they have sent me from Kisi. I'm now supposed to be going to Garissa. Let me not even use Kisi because you might think I'm, I'm saying John has come from Kisi. No, let me use my own place. I have been sent from Kirinyaga and I'm supposed to go to Garissa. And so what do we do with you? Throw me in the sea. And woof, you throw your Jonah. And just like that, a big fish is waiting to swallow the man. You will start thinking that is witchcraft, isn't it? How can he just go and a fish has gone with him? If you see Jonah in your ship, in your, in your ship, you can be sure it's not going to be easy. But if you see Jesus in that ship, then you know you will sail on the other side. It's a song we used to sing in, uh, in, in, uh, in the kids' With Jesus in the vessel, I can smile at the storm. Smile at the storm. Smile at the storm. With Jesus in the vessel, we can smile. 
Jesus in the vessel, you can begin to smile at your storm again. Look at the bigger picture. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Behold what manner of love God has done what? Has given unto us. Jeremiah 31 and verse 3. It says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with an unfailing kindness. I will rebuild you up. Amen. I will rebuild you up. Amen. O Israel. Virgin Israel. You will be rebuilt. This is another assurance. That I have loved you. Irregardless of your storm. My love is everlasting. And it says. I will uphold you. With unfailing kindness. Let me tell you. The faster you know and you are assured of the love of Christ when you are in a storm, the faster you get out of that storm. But the more you doubt God's love in a storm, the longer you stay in the storm. And you know why? Because when you doubt, you begin to help yourself. Because when you doubt, you lose focus on the very place where your help is supposed to come from. And instead of you hiding yourself and crying to God and asking him and reminding him of his promises, you take a totally different path. And then it will be too late for you now to say, I surrender. It will be too late to surrender to him after you have taken so long getting angry, complaining, questioning him. Then you come down and you cry and say, I come. But by then, it might take so much time. But people who quickly see the storm and they know I am being proven, they fall on their knees and surrender. Praise God. I have loved you with an everlasting love. The Lord is reminding us that his love will give us his strength. That it doesn't matter what it is. The love came before. The love preceded the choices that we would make when we are in a storm. We must find strength by that very fact that God's love never fails. I have loved you and I will uphold you with my unfailing kindness. That is what the Lord is telling us. Praise the Lord. I love the book of Isaiah chapter 43. It's one of those books that many people can even recite. And I open it. I'll, I'll open it. You can even display it. 43 Isaiah. Another promise that the Lord is giving us so that you know that all these storms come in our life not to destroy us but to make us get assured of God's love. It is only when you have gone through a storm and you have come out of it that you can stand and boldly proclaim that the Lord is indeed a loving God. O Israel, the Lord who created you says do not be afraid. I will save you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Verse 2 says, when you pass through deep waters, I will be with you. Your troubles will not overwhelm you. Then the other part says, when you walk through fire, you will not be burned. The hard trials that come will not hurt you. I don't know why the that part he says when you pass through I don't know how what King James says when you pass through water and when you pass through a river something like that but when it comes to fire he says when you walk through the fire because sometimes children of God let's not lie to each other there are days that even God himself 
will be proving you through fire. In fact, in the Bible, fire is a symbolic way of refining. I think in the book of Zechariah somewhere, I, I look at the verse. It says, I have refined you like the refiner's fire. You know, like the way gold is refined and silver is refined. Which means that fire is not meant to burn you as a Christian. It is meant to shape you and refine you and make you. You know, when, when they burn gold to make it take the right shape, it has to be burnt to I don't know how many degrees. So that it can melt and become the right shape that it, can, it is supposed to be consumed. And so when you go through fire, the Bible says when you walk, the rest is saying when you pass through. You can pass through water. You can pass through the rivers. But when it comes to fire, my version says you will walk. It means that you will walk slowly as the fire is consuming, is burning you, but it shall not consume you. The Lord is saying that you will not be hurt and you will not be burnt, but you will be refined. Praise the Lord. And you will come out as the right vessel that the Lord wants to use. Praise the Lord. This is what love is all about. Love does not mean that you will have it all the time. Some days you will be proven. And the Lord will be trying to prove your loyalty. He will try to prove your patience. He will try to prove your truthfulness. He will ask you questions. Do you really love me back? Since I have loved you and now you are in the fire, do you disown me or do you still hold on to the very fact that I love you and you can love me back. Praise the Lord. And so the fire is supposed to take us to a presence of God. Where we say, Lord, take over. I think where I have reached, I am tired of helping myself. So sometimes this fire has to take us to a level where we surrender by force. Yeah? You come and you say, I am coming to this garden alone. I don't care what is happening around me. I don't know what, where my children slept last night. But I am facing you as Gladys. I am facing you as Elizabeth. And I am coming to this garden alone. I come to the garden alone. Come to the garden alone. Where the dead is still. Not your brother, not your sister can know. Because even in the storm, you can find the love of God. And you can find joy. And so when you reach at that level, where you have to totally surrender to God, sometimes not out of your own making, because of situations, indeed, you will get it right. Because you will start to prove that the Lord has been with you all this time. And his love preceded even the choices that even you are about to make. Praise the Lord. I want you to pray. I want you to whisper a prayer to God and tell him, I don't know where you are taking me. When I look at my situation, I do not even see tomorrow. I don't even see ahead. And I want you to pray. Please don't look at me. I want you to just talk to your God and tell him the way things look like. I feel I am not assured of your love. Prove to me again that you love me. And may I reach to the level where I come to the garden alone and surrender to you. May I bow down to this love that you have given me so graciously. The chorus. And he walks with me. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he talks. And the 
that I do not know where you are taking me but I will follow you. I will follow you to the end. I will never doubt your love. I know that your love came before even I made a choice to know you. I will never again doubt your love because I know you have assured me in your word countless time that indeed you love me and I will never doubt. And I will make a purpose and a choice to love you and live for you forever. Praise the Lord. Now, if God loves us, the question we ought to ask ourselves, now that we have assured ourselves of God's love, how many feel you are assured of God's love now? If you had doubt in your heart, do you feel like God has assured you of his love? Yes. And if you have not, still go home and close yourself somewhere and tell God, I want to confirm and I want to see you. Behold what lover, or, I mean, what manner of love the Lord has given. I want to see you beyond my situations. Praise the Lord. Two choices that we must make after we have received the love of God. Two, only two. I know there are many, but I only choose two. And these two are a summary of what we have been seeing throughout the week. And the first choice that we must make after we have received the love of God is to choose to genuinely love him back. A genuine love for God. Not the love that you are pretending. Not the love that you want Lena to see you. Not the love that you want people to see you that you are a servant of God. It is the genuine love for God. And why am I saying genuine? Because if you love someone genuinely, there are some things you will do. I loved Juguna so genuinely such that I left my job in South Africa to come and get married in Kenya. To me, I think that was genuine love. Otherwise, I had made up my mind, bye-bye Kenya. When people love each other, they go beyond borders, isn't it? To do something for them, isn't it? They give each other gifts. But what is the genuine love that you have for God? How much far can you go for him? How much heights can you go for him? Or you'll be like Jonah, who will get into that boat and make everybody to sink with him. Because you are running away from where he has sent you. And so, in genuine love for God, it cannot happen without surrender. And I'm repeating this word again, surrender. And I'm talking about total surrender. Total what? Surrender. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14. It's one of the verses that was read by our shepherdess on, on Monday. It says, For the love of Christ constrains in us because we are conf convinced one died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died and rose again. And the point I want to insist us is those who live should no longer live for themselves. That is what is called surrender. And if you reach at a level where you surrender to God, then I can say, or you can say, that you are a spiritually mature person. We have so many spiritual dwarves. Spiritually immature people. And I'm one of them. But until you attain the total level of surrender then you can begin to call yourself a spiritually mature person. Because surrender to God is, comes without conditions. It is without conditions. I don't care whether they are taking away my, my, my children, I mean, from the house because I've not paid rent. I have surrendered, and I have surrendered completely. And all I care is that I am in the arms of the one that loves me. All I care is that love preceded my first choices. And all I care is that when I walk through the fire, he says I will not be burned. All I care is that with Jesus in the vessel, I can smile at the storm. 
and I will cross over to the other side. But surrender comes with conditions. Surrender is not something that you say, I surrender and I surrender and I surrender. No. To surrender means to ask God to take over. When I was on the other side, I usually say the other side, before I became an Adventist, and I was a member of one of the Pentecostal churches. There's a song we used to sing, and you know, I, mean, I don't sing, but this one are attempt. <laughs> they used to say that, take over, Jehovah. Take what? Over, Jehovah. It says, take over, Jehovah. I have come to the end of myself. Can you try? Take over. I have come to the end of myself. I can actually be a choir master. <laughs> People have sung after me. Amen. So, surrender is at a level where you say, I am done with myself. Take over Jehovah. I have come to the end of my pride. I have come to the end of my arrogance. I have come to the end of my smartness. I am done with doing what? With helping myself. In this house of God, we have a lot of pride. We have a lot of arrogance. And this is an indication that many of us have never totally surrendered to God. Because surrender means that you die of self that you die of your wisdom and I'm sorry to use the word death but this is what the Lord says that you have to die he says that unless a corn of wheat falls on the ground okay it has to die for it to rise up so we have to die from self yeah for us to be able to say that indeed we have surrendered a spiritually mature person is that one who is totally surrendered to the will of God. And this is a person you will tell, pray for me, I'm going through this. And they will indeed pray for you. Without talking about you. Spiritually immature people will begin to ask you questions. And on day one of this week of prayer, we were told about a story of a person they went to see, to see a member of the church who was sick. To pray for them. And when they reached there, they found that the guy had a disease, supposedly, which comes out of life's choices. I don't know which ones are those. They did not give us the, the diagnosis. But they said that this disease was one of those diseases that you get because you have made the wrong choices. And one of the members of the congregation that was going to pray said, I cannot pray for such. This is spiritual immaturity. Holier than thou attitude in the house of God. People who look at you and say, look at your children, the way they are dressing in church. It is because your mother did not teach them well. And as that person is still holding their children in their hands. Their babies are still in their hands. Afadali, those ones who are coming to the house of God with short clothes. Because when your time comes and God decides to give you the same race, you will hide. We will look for you and we will not find you. So, spiritual maturity and surrender totally means that you look beyond the choices of the person next to you. Because love precedes our choices and their choices. Amen? I don't love football. I'm not a football fan. At all. Of course, Juguna tells me about, I don't know, Arsenal, Manchester. He tells me that Arsenal is always losing. I don't know if it's true. Maybe it's because he's not a, a member of Arsenal. If he lied to me, please ask him, not me. That Arsenal always loses. But his, the people there, the fans, are very noisy. I don't know whether it's true. They are celebrating even before the game is over, you know? Arsenal people. How many Arsenal people are here? I know they cannot. Today they are afraid to raise their hands. But one of the things I have seen in a game of football is you, who is just a spectator, cheering squad, 
I was a hockey player in, a player in school. And we used to be cheered. You know, when I'm playing hockey, it felt nice when I'm doing... They used to call me Gigi. Gigi, score, score, score. And I used to feel nice, you know. The people who are seated in the stadium, they are the ones that say, look at this man now. Look at him. Ah. Score, score. What's wrong with you, man? Just score. Others are saying, look at him. See how he's running. He's the one that has made us what? Lose the game. Until the referee says, enter into the match. And the first five minutes, you are running all over. <gasps> because you want to prove a point that everybody was not doing it right, you are the one who knows how to score. And the next ten minutes, you are like this. <sighs> because you are running all over. <sighs> to confirm the ones who are making mistakes where they are. Then in ten minutes now, you are like... I can't do it anymore. Substitute me. When it is not your match, you can criticize. When it is not your match, you can question. But when it is your match, you can break. May you not break. May you not break in Jesus' name. I love King David. King David was one of those people who woke up in the morning in total surrender. And in the book of Psalm 63, he says, Oh Lord, you are my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul longeth for thee to see you as I have seen you in the sanctuary. This was King David. This was someone who had totally surrendered. That the first thing he does in the morning when he wakes up is not to snore, is to tune in to power hour. If you're not in power hour and you're a woman, you need to think about it. Early will I seek for thee to see you just as I have seen you in the sanctuary. And in other verses he says, as the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. I don't know whether you know that song. As the deer panteth for the waters of my soul longeth after thee. You, alone are my heart's desire, and I long to song is in the Bible. Of course, I know most Adventists may not know these songs because we are used to Musani and uh, women of Vala. It's a wonderful song. It is a prayer that as the deer panteth for the water, so does my soul long after thee. This is someone who is thirsty for who? For God. You used to say 10 years ago that you know I have this uncle in Nairobi he can't even help anybody. Okay? You, you know those things. Eh? I have come to Nairobi he doesn't give me fare. He, you know he's just there and you know since he married that woman eh, women always blamed for everything. When the men don't give people money that woman uh-huh. He doesn't even go home to his mother since he married that woman. When they don't go home, it's you. Who oh, he comes home too much. I think the wife is now giving him headache. He wants to come to his mother. Imagine, when they go, it's you. When they don't, it's you. That rich uncle, that rich brother, 
has abandoned his family. Now you are the rich uncle. Now go to your mother. It is a turn for your wife to be blamed. He does not give us money. You go and scatter your money in the family now. When the match is not yours, you can criticize. Until you become the rich uncle and start asking, they are looking for the money and you are like, why are you coming to me? Do you remember 10 years ago when your uncle gave you money just because he gave you 100 shillings and you were expecting 1,000? You criticized. Now you don't even have 20 bob to give them. Oh, my father, my friend used to tell me one time we went to Roiro and we were looking for land and we saw all those brought Maguta Maguta in Roiro. Huh? And she asked me, eh, where was my father when they were buying this land in, in Mebley? And I told her, your father, you know us, we are from Kirinyaga, we are not from Nairobi, so even us, we are just newcomers of Kiambu and all that place. I said, eh, maybe you need to ask him. You can even have the audacity to blame your dad. And your father raised eight of you in one house. Not even one day you are kicked out of your home. But today, two children, no school fees, school, there's no rent. When the game is not yours, you can criticize. Ask God to help you to surrender to him. I want you to pray. God, I surrender. Allow me a moment to tell you how much I love you. How much I want to surrender to you. Look and at your life and ask God, what is it in me that has not fully submitted to your will? Is it my pride? Is it my arrogance? Is it my, 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 my what can I say? My smartness? You know, even being smart is a problem. Too much smartness is a problem. Sometimes it's good to allow some space for dust in your shoes. Ask him, I surrender to you. And the second and the last choice is to make a love choice to serve the Lord. This is what we saw in the week. This is the last point. The first one was to make a choice to genuinely love him and surrender to him. And the second one is to make a love choice to serve the Lord. When you serve the Lord, you must have first understood his love. And that's why this, this theme was very key and critical. And if you think about it critically, you will see what the Lord had unveiled to this year, Women Ministries Prayer Week. A love that precedes one's choices means the love comes first before you surrender. The love comes first before you give up. The love even comes first before you serve. Because if you go to service without that love, you are serving yourself. But if the love of Christ has come first in your life, even the way you treat other people in your service will be different. Praise the Lord. Make a love choice to serve the Lord with all your heart. Let me tell you a fact. Even if we don't serve God, he will not change. Even if we don't come to church, this church will be full. And I'm telling you a fact. Even if you are the deaconate, I know we always have around 200 deacons, but we have a handful of them that serve. Even if you are that deacon in the list who was elected and has never stepped in this sanctuary to serve the Lord, the Lord will still be served. Because he says, I am who I am and I do not change. If you think that this church is sustained by your tithes, you are spiritually immature. And that is why a lot of people, when they are angry with the leadership of the church, they say we are withholding our tithes. That is a level of immaturity. It means you do not understand what tithes do for you, not for God. 
Praise the Lord. God is self-sufficient. God does not even need you who is still thinking whether to serve him or not. Because he remains, I am who I am. So if he calls us to serve him, it is a privilege. Praise the Lord. If he ever invites us to serve him, count it as a privilege. But I was in the nominating committee last week, I mean this year, but you give someone a paper, tell them that we have nominated you to serve the Lord, and they come back and they tell you, you know, this year I can't. This year, I cannot. Why? I'm doing my masters, and you know, my masters are taking a lot of my time. Spiritual immaturity. If he ever invites you to serve him, it is our privilege. And I will prove to you why. Because serving the Lord does not benefit God. It benefits us. It benefits who? If you ever at any one time open the pages of the word of God, you will see the promises that the Lord has bestowed upon them that serve him. And my favorite one is always the book of Exodus chapter 23, 25 and 26. That you shall serve the Lord your God with all your heart and he shall bless your food and your water. He will take away sickness from you. He says, none of you shall be barren in the land. He says, there will be no miscarriages in your camp. And he says, I will fulfill and I will bless you with a long life. Isn't that a package? Isn't that a package? You want blessings for your food and your water, isn't it? Do you want sickness? He says, I will take away sickness from you, from a midst of you. And he says, none in your land shall be barren. And there will be no miscarriages. And miscarriages are talking about many things. Beyond just the normal, you know, women miscarriages. It is premature death. It's talking about other issues that you plan and they have failed. And the most important one of them all, he will reward you with long life. How many want to die tomorrow? None. This is a blessing attached to service. If you take God at his word, it starts by saying, you shall serve the Lord your God. That means if you are not serving him, you have no audacity to start and start asking for those things. It means that serving the Lord is essentially for our own benefit. It is not for God's benefit. May God's grace be sufficient to you to serve him. May God's grace be sufficient to you to serve him. Now, we need to reach to a level whereby we tell God and we look at ourselves and make serving God a delight. Not because of the things that we are getting. Again, surrender means irregardless of what come, I will serve the Lord. Not because I want that water of mine to be blessed. It is because irregardless, it is God's command. So that when I stand in my prayer life, I can tell him, God, I have been serving. At least I have something to negotiate. Okay? At least you can try. We have to reach that level whereby serving God is a delight. And if you have not been called a name for serving God, maybe you are not trying enough. Becky. Which are you Madam Choir? How many have been confused for shepherdesses? Only me. You know, Joguna, whether it is sport day or it is family day, shati, na trouser, official. So wherever we go, pastor, 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 pastor. And the wife, Ameva Jeans, behind him. And they're not sure, is she a shepherdess or not? If you have not been even nicknamed by anybody, called, what are you always going to do in church? Maybe your service is not yet speaking properly. There's a day my father asked me, Ulikuwa kanisa Monday. You are in church on Tuesday. Eh? You are again in church on Wednesday. And he asked me, and I was only 22 years old, are you the pastor's wife? As in, how can you be saying 
that you are always going to the sanctuary to do what? Unless you are the pastor himself or the wife, isn't it? Have people in your plot labeled you and told you you are the servant of the most high God? Has anyone called you that name? How many have been called that name? How many people have been called pastors? And you are not. Wonderful. Thank you, Elder Ndualo. Even me, I call you pastor. If where you live, there is nothing that can attach you to God's presence, there is a problem. I like King, I like King Darius as I conclude. The King Darius. He was so sad that the only person that was genuinely serving the Lord in his palace was Daniel. And so, when it came to a time when they said that we must throw Daniel in the lion's den, the king was sad. You remember that story? The Bible says that he was disturbed that Daniel has to be thrown in the lion's den. Even though he was a king, he had to sign that Daniel to be thrown in the lion's den. But I like the names that he calls Daniel. In the book of Daniel chapter 6 and verse 16, and he says, I'll read this one as the last one. But you can display it. I thought I would have it on my end. Daniel. Daniel chapter 6, verse 16. This is what the king says to Daniel. Verse 16. Um, it says, so the king gave an order for Daniel to be arrested and he was thrown into the pit filled with lions and he said to Daniel you know he has he has signed a decree he has even opened the lions gates for the for the man to be consumed but he says something special to Daniel he says like this he says may you are god whom you serve Look at this man. He's a king. May your God, whom you serve, continually rescue you. There was no doubt that Daniel was a servant of God. The king could not lie to himself that Daniel was a true servant of God. And that's why he says, may the God who you serve continually do what? Rescue you. Because Daniel could not hide the fact that he was a true servant of God. I don't know if people have ever called you a servant of God. Can somebody stand in front and defend you and say that you are a true servant of God? They, they may not because you are the number one criticizers. Sometimes people come to me, oh, women ministry leader, oh, there you are leading us. Is, that, is this now Dorcas? Is this now women ministry? Is this now community service? I ask them, what, what do you think about yourself? Stop telling me about doctors and women, ministry and what. The most important thing, who are you yourself? Is that really what you need to focus on? The most important thing is I am the beloved of the Lord, the daughter of Zion, and the daughter of the most high God. Whether I am placed in doctors or women ministries, I don't, I, don't, I don't really care. In the end of the day, the real message is who are you? It's not who you associate with. It is who you are. And you are a beloved of the Lord. And the next verse, as I finish, again, uh, the king is telling Daniel. So it went on and went on. And, and now the king has to ask, I mean, it has happened. He was thrown in the den of lions and the lions did not consume him. And the Bible says that that night, the king did not sleep. He was agonizing he was thinking and wondering, what, what if Daniel was consumed? But somehow he had a little faith that maybe the God that Daniel serves continually might rescue him. And the first thing, the Bible says that first thing in the morning, the king went to visit Daniel. And this is what he asks Daniel on verse 19. He says this way, he says, oh, I think I'm growing old, my friends. I can't even read my own Bible. At dawn, the king got up and hurried to the pit. When he got there, he called out anxiously, 
Daniel, servant of the living God. Look at this. Daniel, servant of who? Of the living God. Was your God who you serve? Look at this again. So loyally, he has now even added another adverb able to save you from the lions. This is the king, an even king. Was the God who you serve able to save you from the lions? I like the way Daniel answered. He answered and said, May your majesty live forever. God sent his angel. God did what? Sent his angel to shut the mouths of the lions so that they would not hurt me. He did this because he knew that I was innocent and because I have not wronged you, your majesty. God defends his servants. Let me tell you, don't look at it as if it is a joke. There are some things that you will only receive because of your service. Because you are serving God, there are some things that the Lord will do to preserve you. And God knew very well that this was the only man in that palace that could represent him. And so he had no business killing this man. Maybe the Lord is saving you for your family because you are the only one that can represent him in that family. But you are letting him down. You are not assured of his love. You are not yet behaving like one who is indeed standing in the gap for your family. The Lord has put you there even when your children are misbehaving. Your husband, your wife is misbehaving to continually go on their knees on your knees for them and not to give up. Will the God that you serve continually save you from the lion's den? Sometimes you have to reach a point where you tell God, I will go wherever you send me. As long as it is serving you. I told you, don't come with lame reasons that I'm doing my masters, I cannot serve. That I am having a small baby, I cannot serve. That you know this year, you know I, I, I want to focus on my projects. There are no blessings in the word of God that are attached to masters. There are no blessings in this Bible that are attached to raising children. The only blessings that are here are attached to those who love God genuinely and are serving him. I will go wherever you want me to go. Or over the stormy sea It may not be a prayer and I want you to sing just the chorus prayerfully as you tell God as if you mean it that indeed I will say what you want me to say. That indeed I will go wherever you want me to go. It is a song, it is a prayer. Sing it prayerfully as though you are promising him and you are giving him a new uh, a new covenant with you. I'll go. I'll go where you want me to go Say what you want me 
Father, in the mighty and precious name of Jesus Christ, we come back to thank you because we prayed and we asked you that you may speak to us. And indeed, what we have received is what you desired for us to hear. I want to pray for my brothers and my sisters here, even the children that are represented here, that they have made a choice to love you back for the love that you loved us with. The love that you say that you have loved us with an everlasting love. That you have upheld us with your unfailing kindness. The love that you indeed called us your sons and daughters. The love that made you to send your own son to come and die for us. If anyone here is doubting your love because of the storms of life, may you reassure them. If anyone here is afraid and they do not know how to face tomorrow, may you help them know that your love will propel them there. If any one of us is worried that they are not serving you right, may you reassure them with your love again, Jehovah. I want to pray that none of these ladies and men that are seated here shall ever, ever give up on you. And if anyone is giving up, Jehovah, May you uphold them with your love. May you lift them up, O oh God. May you show them your mercy, dear Father. I pray that every woman that has been coming this week and had a prayer request, a lot of prayer requests that have been put on this prayer box, O oh God, oh God, may you answer them, O oh God. I pray that if there's any person that is seeking you and they feel that you are silent, I know that you are in a corner in that boat. May you show up for them, Jehovah. Thank you, dear Lord, because I know you've heard us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.